So I'm going to give you a short 15-minute talk. I think we've probably been starting late because of the traffic, which is OK. And I'm going to tell you basically the four things you could do, but I can tell you very few organizations are doing, uh, to fix the problem of health in the workplace. Let me begin with a statistic. 90% of US healthcare spend is spent on chronic disease. I'm, that number needs to sit with you for a second. 90% of the 3.x trillion dollars that the US spends on healthcare is spent for chronic disease. Chronic disease comes, importantly, though not exclusively, from stress and the addictive behaviors, smoking, drinking, alcohol use, drug abuse, overeating, that stress induces. What that means is that if you want to solve the healthcare problem in the US, and by the way, this is not just true for the US. Healthcare costs are soaring in India, they're soaring in China, they're soaring in other medium and more developed countries because the problem of the workplace and toxic workplaces is in fact a, per a, a pervasive problem. So if you want to solve the problem of healthcare costs anywhere in the world, you need to address the workplace because the workplace is, in the United States, according to research that I and two colleagues did, the fifth leading cause of death, ahead of Alzheimer's and ahead of kidney disease. This is not an unsolvable problem. I'm going to tell you four things that you can do, could do, can do, to fix workplace stress. The first thing I will tell you is what you should not do. Do not implement nap pods, yoga, goat yoga, <laughs> stress reduction. We in the US have made a wonderful industry, maybe many industries, out of remediation. I'm going to make you ill. I'm going to deprive you of sleep and give you a place to nap. I'm going to stress the hell out of you and then give you a relaxation class to fix the problem that I have caused. It should not be a surprise to any human being in this room, or for that matter, any sentient human being, which leaves out a good portion of the human resources people I know, <laughs> that prevention is not only less expensive than remediation, it is much more effective. Rather than stressing the hell out of you, depressing the hell out of you, and filling you with drugs, it is much easier, simpler, and in fact feasible to redesign work environments so they do not pre pre prevent, uh, produce stress and depression in the first place. Completely possible. Completely possible. Do four things. Number one is the quality movement has taught us Anything that is not measured is not managed. A single item measure of self-reported health, a single item measure, let me repeat that, a single item measure of self-reported health, prospectively predicts mortality, morbidity, and healthcare costs. If you are doing surveys and not measuring self-reported health, add one item, not too hard to do. There are validated measures small scales that measure behavioral slash mental health measure. You cannot figure out if any of your interventions are working if you do not measure. You cannot figure out the depth of your problem if you do not measure. And most importantly, you cannot hold human beings accountable for the well-being, both physical and mental, of their workforce, which I believe you should do, if you do not measure. Measurement is easy. It is reliable, it is simple, it, and it and is predictive. By the way, the single item measure of self-reported health prospectively predicts controlling for biomarkers such as body mass index and other and blood pressure and other things, prospectively predicts mortality and morbidity, and it does that for the young, because they've now done this, this has been validated a zillion times. It does it for the young, it does it for the old, it does it for Pacific Islanders, it does it for African Americans. This is a measure which has been extraordinarily well validated, and it is enormously pervasive in the healthcare literature. 
Number one, measure. You cannot measure, manage anything if you don't measure it. Number two, comprehensively address health issues. If you are an employee of Stanford University, as I am, Stanford University has probably a typical large company, large organization approach to healthcare issues, which means that it is terminally stupid. And it is terminally stupid in the following ways. We have, of course, like everybody else, outsourced our benefits to a benefits administrator. In our case, it's California Blue Shield. It wouldn't matter if it was Aetna. It wouldn't matter if it was United Health. They all have the same problem. And the problem is, number one, they believe that they have saved you money if they have restricted access to some service. And the access that, you, that law, legislation notwithstanding, that um, benefits administrators have restricted access to is mental health benefits. It is hard to access mental health benefits. I don't want you to see a psychiatrist too often. I don't want you to see a counselor too often because after all, it's all in your goddamn mind. And if I give you some goat yoga, at the end, you know, you're going to be fine. The stupidity of this is that a colleague and I did a study, published, believe it or not, in the Journal of Psychiatric Research. Depression prospectively predicts, prospectively predicts. This means I measure an end, a marker of depression, time one. I measure diseases as you take drugs for those diseases down the road. Depression prospectively predicts cardiovascular disease, 59% higher rate of cardiovascular disease if you are depressed. 60%, is it 60? Yes. Uh, cancer, 50%, diabetes, 30%. So as we are restricting access because we think we're saving money to mental health benefits, we are, of course, causing physical health benefits, physical health conditions that cost a fortune. You have to be either stupid or a health benefits administrator to operate, um, to oper to operate in that fashion. Secondly, it's, there's an article in the New York Times about this. We know one-fourth of all U.S. healthcare spend, I'm not making these numbers up, you look up the Center for Disease Control, one-fourth of all U.S. healthcare spend is for diabetes. One fourth, you need to think of that. It's, we're talking eight, nine hundred million dollars a year. There are now drugs, drugs, not crappy drugs, real drugs that have been validated that actually prevent obesity, which is the number one issue for diabetes, the number one cause of diabetes. And as you might imagine, my genius friends, Aetna, United Health, California Blue Shield, Anthem, or Anthem's renamed itself, I guess, of course, restricts, limits, actually forbids access to these drugs because I've saved you money. I'm not going to get you treatment to prevent diabetes. Instead, we're going to pay a gazillion dollars to amputate and deal with all the, the, the heart disease and the other problems that diabetes causes. One measure, two comprehensively address your health issues. Do not restrict access to behavioral health. Do not restrict access to weight loss drugs. In other words, if you know the pathway that creates a disease, a sensible organization, which leaves out most of the ones that I know, would in fact intervene on the pathway so that you never get the disease. Because intervening in the pathway is a hell of a lot cheaper than intervening when, the, when, when you're now hor horribly sick. But in order to do this, you will need to talk sternly or maybe administer your health benefits yourself because as far as I can tell, the health benefits administrators don't do anything. Number three, implement employee-centered job design. Everybody has read about the great resignation and the great not showing up at work and doing anything and the great, you know, and the great sleep and the great this and the great that. And the reason why is because we have systematically designed jobs that do not refresh or it stimulate people, but they enervate people. Now, if I said to you, I'm going to design a computer or I'm going to design a product, a consumer product, and I'm going to do it without talking to my customers, you would, of course, 
immediately say I was nuts. Because in fact, we, we have D school at the Stanford. We have the Hassel Plattner Design School, which teaches customer-focused job design. You go out in the world, you look at people, you know, a customer-focused product design. You look, at, you look at how people use the product. You redesign the little tubes, um, the, the little things. By the way, if all, is you, if all of you are on your cell phones every day, you don't know it, but you're part of an experience, experiment. Because every day, Google, Facebook, and everybody else is changing font size. They're changing colors. They're changing everything to get you, in quotes, addicted. That's actually not in quotes. That's actually what they're trying to do, to get you addicted to the products, in this case, the service that they are selling you. It is completely possible to do employee-centered job design. I have a friend who took over One Medical, which is being sold to Amazon. And he said, my doctors are burned out. By the way, physician burnout is a huge problem. If you have a doctor now, take a good look at that, him or her, because according to statistics, within some of uh, the 20% of them will be gone within a year. That's a true figure. Physician burnout is enormous. And by the way, when the physicians are burned out, your care is not so good, because when, when physicians are burned out, they're not at their best. OK. So Amir Rubin, who used to run Stanford Healthcare, comes to One Medical, and he says, we are going to fix the problem of physician burnout. People believe the problem of physician burnout is impossible to fix. I have a colleague who basically has made a career out of studying physician burnout. This is called the knowing doing problem. We study it, we don't do anything about it. But on the other hand, we have lots of statistics documenting its severity. First thing he does, he hires 100 software engineers to redesign and custom make software. There is no doctor I know who likes Epic. There's a special place in hell for the woman who built the Epic system. And, it, and by the way, became a billionaire because of it. Epic is a billing system. It is not an electronic health record. It's true. Build software custom tailored to the job that you want to do. Poor Hassel Plattner, a man who I actually got to meet once when I wrote a case on an employee who worked with him, said to me, why can't I get my, I'm the supposedly, I'm the co-founder of SAP. I'm like this big deal. I can't get my software engineers to design software for the people as opposed to designing it like as they want to design it and make the people fit the software. He says, why can't we get the software fit the people? I got a design center school in Stanford named after me. I can't get my designers to do what I teach in the design school. Huh? So you got trouble, but I can make some suggestions, which I'm not going to tell you today. It is completely possible to build employee-centered jobs in the same way that you would build customer-focused products. Go from the employee out. Get rid of unnecessary tasks. Give them tools, custom design to the jobs that they're going to do. Get rid of unnecessary work. This is called process re-engineering. Make life efficient. What a weird idea that is. And my final suggestion, which will end, and we'll end on time. Look at that. Eliminate those workplace factors that we know from decades, by the way, not years, decades of research, that cause stress and depression in the workplace. And what are those factors? Economic insecurity, which means you don't know your schedule and you don't know if you're going to have a job, because the one thing that the US workforce specializes in is layoffs. I'm flying down from Alaska. I'm sitting next to a guy. I happen to be in first class. God knows why. I say to the guy next to me, I said, who are you? Or let's, we start talking. I said, what do you do? He said, I run Delta Airlines on the West Coast. I said, how's that going? He said, not good. We cannot staff our flights. We cannot staff the ground crew. We are over capacity. And I said, I don't want to have you, you know, hit me or anything. But I'm going to ask you one simple question. How many months was it between the last layoff and the workforce shortage? The airlines that now cannot operate, Heathrow Airport, which cannot operate, Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, they cannot operate, laid people off. Laid people off. How many minutes? This is a wonderful thing, by, by, by the way, that the Silicon Valley has absolutely optimized on. It's called buying high and selling low. 
First thing I do, buy high. Second thing I do, I, I buy, I hire people at the moment when I have to pay huge bonuses, and having hired them, I then lay them off. Economic security, work hours. Many people believe you can work lots of hours. There's no, not, not one piece of physiological evidence for that. The longer you work, the higher your blood pressure, etc. Number three, work-family conflict, which the COVID has, of course, made absolutely clear. It turns out if you can't balance your work and your non-work demands, you're in trouble. Four, an absence of job control. The idea that you have no autonomy, that somebody is telling you what to do every nanosecond, which is not good. We know, we've known for 50 years that job autonomy is positively related to things. By the way, the absence of job control kills you. And finally, the absence of health insurance. Everybody believes that if you work for a large organization, you've got health insurance. You may have, though the Kaiser Family Foundation will point out that even in large organizations that offer health insurance, only about 60% of the people have it. How can that be? Money, eligibility requirements. One third of the US workforce, according to Gallup, answers in the affirmative when they say, have you had to postpone filling a prescription or getting health care because of cost. The absence of health care leads to bad health outcomes. Big surprise. If you do those four things, get rid of the things that we know cause stress and depression at work. Measure behavioral and physical health. Use, do employee-centered job design and comprehensively address health issues by intervening to prevent rather than treat You'll solve all of your problems. You'll become more profitable. You'll have less turnover. You'll have less absence. And you'll make me happy. Thank you.